Welcome everyone. It's uh, 11 o'clock central time, so we'll get started here. Uh, this is the second part of our Dutch Elm Disease Summer Series. So I'm Chris Haugen. I'll be your, your host and guide for the morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, today's topic is Dutch Elm Disease Part 2, uh, macro infusion training for Dutch Elm Disease, and really how to improve your application. So this is Part 2 of Tuesday's uh, webinar with Tom Prosser, he went over really the biology and kind of the overall management strategy for it and touched on uh, macro infusion with diabendazole with Arbitec in a little bit uh, from just kind of a management key distinctions. But uh, I'll be going over more of the application side of it and really how you go through the process step by step. So thank you for jumping in. Um, we'll get started here. Uh, so my name uh, is Chris Haugen. And I am uh, 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 with Rainbow Scientific Advancements here. And in my role, I help support our sales staff, but I've also, as a technician, I worked in the field as a Dutch Elm disease uh, crew leader for many years. So I have a, a good amount of experience with uh, Dutch Elm disease. So today, um, a couple things with housekeeping. Um, if you would, oops, pardon me, uh, uh, add in your ISA certification number um, into the, the chat or the Q&A. It's at the bottom there. Um, we'll make sure that we get those entered in uh, because today is worth one ISA CEU. Um, if you did not uh, uh, um, do it during registration, just do it now and we'll make sure we get you recorded. Um, another little bit of housekeeping here. So if you do have questions, um, I am uh, solo today. So I will be doing double duty of doing the presentation while also monitoring the questions um, if you would, just please uh, type your questions into the Q&A, not the chat feature. Um, it's a little easier for me to manage just questions to make sure that I don't miss any, or if uh, there's any that come up, I can respond to those as we go. So thank you, and let's kick it off today. So really today, um, we have three, out well, three outcomes for the most part. Um, I want to first give you a step-by-step -step process for macro infusion for Arbitec. And certainly a lot of these principles with tree injection do hold true for all tree injection. Um, we'll want to follow much the same process and kind of uh, the key distinctions that we have here. And then Tom mentioned this on Tuesday, there are several common pitfalls that can cause full uptake or may cause treatment failures. And we'll be going through those in step by step. Um, and then I'll just give a quick touch on how to maintain some of the equipment that we're using to, that we would be using today for macro infusion. Um, and I think, you know, the biggest difference um, really that we're touching on today with macro infusion versus micro infusion, as Tom indicated with those, those bark beetles, they feed in those bark cracks. So we need to get complete and even uh, distribution of the fungicide throughout the entire canopy, which is also part of why we recommend using macro infusion in addition to the, the product itself. And I do want to point out we have a multitude of resources available to you um, because certainly we understand that uh, you know, you're training new technicians or maybe you just need a quick refresher. Um, we have our RTSA technical support and field training available and I'll put those numbers up here shortly. Uh, we have a really nice step by step application guide as well um, pictured here with 115 volt and 12 volt pumps and this and really honestly that application guide it has um, all the same exact information that i'm going to be presenting in a just the same exact step-by-step -step process because when it comes to it this is a step-by-step -step process that has a lot of little details and a lot of small nuances that really add up to making a big difference in ensuring you have that high level of performance but also having that predictable application time uh, because i think probably the most frequent uh, question that we have around this entire protocol is how do I do it faster and how do I do it predictably? Um, and those pitfalls that we talked about, those are probably when you call into tech support, those are going to be the first few questions that we're going to ask about because it's most often uh, one of those or a couple of those that get missed throughout the process. And then we have the Arbitech product guide, which is nice to have on hand because it has the rates and a really nice easy to use rate card. And then we have application videos um, up on YouTube and I'll, I'll make sure that those get sent out at the end of the day. We have a really fantastic step-by-step uh, -step video and you'll probably recognize a lot of the photos and images that are in there. Uh, myself and Matt Karst from Marketing did the, that video last year. Um, 
it takes about five minutes and it's a really nice video and um, if we have time i'll even show that at the end of the day here so perfect with that with our tech support um, and i'd highly recommend everybody just create a new contact in your cell phone for you and your technicians um, to have these numbers in here whether it's the phone number to call in or you want to text with someone or just emailing that support um, we have this staffed by arborists and people that know exactly what you're doing out in the field um, and can take care of you and support you with what you need out in the field. Because it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to get field tech support the next day. So we staff this um, all day long, um, 365 days, pretty much a year. So if you need support out in the field, we're there to help you. So with that, um, these are the eight steps for macro infusion. Um, and really these are going to be in that application guide and we're going to go through these step by step in depth so that you get a nice overview of how you do this in depth um, and what uh, some of the pitfalls would be so with that um, i mentioned those pitfalls so keep in the back of your mind and as you're listening uh, to some of these pitfalls and these are what i'm going to probably bring up um, but these are the seven most common pitfalls that we see to macro infusion the first one being the drill bits aren't razor sharp um, and I'll go into this uh, in a bit more detail here, but we want razor sharp surgical like instruments to make these infusion sites. We've been spinning the drill bit in the hole um, that's going to cause excess heat, which can cauterize that xylem tissue. T is not placed onto the root flares or they're not spaced correctly or in the incorrect places. The T's are pushed in too far. Um, sometimes I think our technicians get a little bit overzealous with uh, the, the mallet and the hammer. Perhaps the T's are clogged, or there's unequal pressure inside the harness. So the first step, whenever we're going to be doing Dutch elm disease treatments, is we want to inspect the tree. Now, this is just a good practice in general to check for any um, hangers that might be in there or any potential hazards that might be in the tree. But we want to inspect this tree thoroughly for Dutch elm disease. Tom went over this in great detail with kind of looking for those symptoms uh, for any flagging up in the canopy because we wanna make sure that we're not treating trees that are already infected. Um, and this is where that tracing protocol comes in. And Tom spent a lot of time going through that in depth because that is an absolute critical part to our management strategy. So we wanna make sure that we inspect to double check for any flagging. The second is um, double check that it's an American elm or even that it's an elm in general. Um, unfortunately, sometimes those uh, uh, trees on properties, you know, it's, oh, it's the elm tree out in the back of the yard, you know, it's about 30 inches. Well, unfortunately, at the end of uh, maybe a long week, the technician maybe doesn't uh, double check that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but every year we seem to get a question from in the tech support of, hey, um, I treated a silver maple with Arbitec and it took forever. Uh, what's going to happen to that tree? Thankfully, nothing happens, but uh, double check that it's an American elm uh, and especially you want to double check because if you're treating other species like red elm or Chinese elm, um, it is a different rate. And a quick little sort of uh, device that I learned uh, very early on was uh, if you to identify American elms, take a piece of that corky bark off and should have a little bit of uh, white tissue to it. And it'll look like, I think, bacon. Um, and Americans like our bacon, so it's uh, an American elm. Um, so just double check that. Are there any issues uh, also with the root flare? Maybe um, there's a, a new concrete uh, uh, sidewalk that was put in or paver stones that we're going to have to navigate around how to get even distribution. So just double check those and go through them uh, in greater detail. Um, when we're inspecting the tree, um, as with any plant health care or any, you know, whenever we're doing work um, as an arborist, it's our, our responsibility to look for any additional health issues that it may have whether it's a root rot, um, girdling roots, um, maybe some scale issues, whatever that might be, just to take note of those. Um, look for signs of decay in the root collar area. Um, if there's a lot of decay present, uh, it may not be something that we don't, that we, it may not be something that we want to treat. And then from a, a, an actual application standpoint, um, we are using a large volume of water. Um, so if you're using the on-site water from perhaps the homeowner, it's a good idea to start filling that reservoir. Um, some people have notoriously low water pressure. So you wanna start filling that 30 or 50 gallon uh, barrel with your, your water source early just to get it going. Because the last thing you wanna do is 
have it excavated, drilled out, and ready to go, and you're still waiting on the water to fill. So just start filling that, and certainly place the barrel close to the tree. Um, you know, 30 to 50 gallons of water gets quite heavy, and you don't want to be trying to move that barrel, have to empty it, and then move it. So strategically place it. I generally prefer to put it if there's a slight slope to the property. Um, I, I generally try to put the barrel at the on the top on the upside of the tree. Um, you might as well use gravity while you have it. So just a little thing to think about as you're working through the property. Um, if you do have a very large tree, say 50 inches in diameter, um, I would suggest considering using two, um, macro, two of the pump systems. Um, you'll have one set of tube and T's, but uh, you might uh, want to have two pumps just to make sure that you're getting um, that product to flow through that uh, reservoir. Now we come to a key step, um, excavating and cleaning off the root flare. With macro infusion specifically, we want to make sure that we are excavating this root flare. And it's not simply because um, it gives you better distribution and it's, you know, the, the, the infusion sites are then hidden from then on. It actually has some physiological um, benefit and reasoning behind it. So the root tissue is far more conductive. It compartmentalizes more efficiently. And actually that conductive tissue is deeper. So we get much faster uptake than we would if we were to try to go even up higher on the root flare. Con uh, contrasting that to our micro injections, you know, for whether you're doing emerald ash bore or bacterial leaf scorch or any of those other multitude of micro -appl applications where we're maybe going right at the soil line or even just above it, this we actually want to excavate that root flare down. And I like to get at least eight to 10 inches below the top of the root flare. So you can see here, this is our soil line. And then in the following photo, you'll see how deep I'm talking. And don't be shy about giving yourself plenty of room to work. Um, when I'm training technicians, one of the more common things is they try to kind of speed up the process and reduce how much you know they have to excavate. I like to take, you can see my shovel here. I want to give myself at least a shovel, you know, the, the shovel uh, face width. So give yourself plenty of room to work with. Give yourself a nice shallow trench to work into so that you got plenty of room to clean off that root flare, insert your tubes and T's and make sure that they're not trying to push out because you've got such a shallow trench. And then a big benefit to this is you're also dramatically increasing the amount of surface area you have for T emplacement. Um, you know, the recommendation I have is 1.5 times your diameter for the number of infusion sites. That's a guideline. If you've got a really nice root flare like this American Elm here, you're probably going to end up with maybe two times the diameter with the a number of application sites. That's a good thing. You're going to get far better lateral distribution. And if you think back to that first slide I had where it was kind of painting the inside of the vascular tissue, that's our ultimate goal. So the more infusion sites appropriately spaced, the better we're going to have for our distribution. So you can see how deep I'm excavating and cleaning off this root flare. So in our prior photo here, the root flare, as you can see right where this dark line is, that's where the actual originating soil line was. And this brush is probably about three and a half, four inches um, in, in kind of width. So I'm getting down there pretty deep. And you can see this tissue change. That's really what we want to be looking at. You can see how nice and soft and how much more moisture and conductive tissue there is on that soil, on that root, that root flare. The lower we get down onto that, the more surface area we have. And then also there's a notice that difference in how smooth that bark tissue is. It's so much easier to, 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 to place your two, your T's, your infusion T's onto that smooth tissue versus if we have to go up higher into that corky bark. It's much more um, undulating. It's hard to get the T's to stay in. They have a tendency to want to pop out. So try to get as low as you can under that root flare and give yourself plenty of time, plenty of room to work down there. And you'll see, I do make it a point of brushing off the root flare. It's not just because I like to work in a clean environment, it's because I wanna be able to see exactly what that tissue looks like. Now you don't have to have a hose and, and wash it off, but you wanna get as much of that mineral soil off as we possibly can. So you can see kind of where I'm in the middle here, it's much cleaner than here on the far right of the image. Oh, uh, Kirk said he's having a little hard time hearing me. I'll speak a little louder. Maybe I'll, I'll talk into my mic. My apologies there, guys. 
Um, a question from Ben Taylor here is, why not use an air spade? It seems more efficient and potentially less damaging to trees. Absolutely. If you have an air spade available to do these root collar excavations, um, I am on board 100% with that. It's certainly um, a little easier. The one thing that I do right, you know, say is it, it's certainly more equipment that you've got to bring to the property, um, but it is great to have it there. Um, it certainly is going to be potentially less damaging. Um, and certainly when we're digging, I should have mentioned you're exactly right. We want to make sure that we're avoiding damaging that root flare. So it's not just um, you know, using your shovel, it's maybe a hand trowel or getting up nice and close and just being real, real careful how you're excavating. You don't want to pull off that you know, exterior bark and wound the root flare, absolutely. If you do have a large property where you have multiple trees, absolutely, the, the air spade is going to be a big uh, time saver. But in the case of doing, let's just say one tree on one property where it's in a nice mulch area, it may not save you that much labor. As far as damaging kind of you know, the fibrous root flare or fibrous roots, pardon me, it doesn't dramatically impact that. Um, so it's definitely a good idea to have them there. Um, Kirk, if you can hear me better, um, just put that into the, to the chat and uh, I just wanna confirm that for you. And then as far as cleaning off the root flare, we also do want to um, brush it off because it does save our drill bits. As I mentioned, we wanna have those drill bits razor sharp that prevents you know, the mineral soil from dulling our drill bits and even pulling it into those infusion sites because drill bits and mineral soil, just like a chainsaw, they don't mix well. So the more we can keep that drill bit clean, the better tissue and be uh, the better cut on that tissue we're gonna have. The next part we're gonna talk about is here, drilling. So I re we always recommend using a razor sharp 1564 drill bit. So we want to be cutting that tissue. And it, it's a it's a common, you know, it oh, it seems to be just fine. What's the difference between a drill bit, you know, what's a brad point or just even a shift bit? We want to use a razor sharp high helix drill bit. And a high helix drill bit has cutting surfaces on all parts. So when it's going in the tree and even coming back out when we pull it out, it is still cutting that tissue. And I don't recommend just you know going down to the hardware store and just picking up any old drill bit and, oh, it's close enough. Think of this as we are doing a surgical type cut on this tissue. So make sure you're investing in, your, in a good drill bit. Don't you know, take care of your drill bits because they'll take care of you. And this is you know, one of those pitfalls where we ask, well, when's the last time you changed your drill bit? How did you store your drill bit? Where do you store your drill bit? Where'd you buy it from? Um, don't be just pulling a drill bit out of the bucket that's been rusting and sitting on the bottom, you know, and had equipment thrown on it. We want to make sure these are razor sharp drill bits. Now we recommend changing your bits every five trees. That doesn't mean that you can't use those drill bits for other things around the shop. They're still quite sharp. It's just, we want to have them razor sharp. And a good kind of uh, point is we talk about find the pigtails. So, and I'll show it later on here, but um, you'll see these long kind of, as the, as the drill bit goes in, it'll pull those chips out and you wanna have long, nice curly pigtails. A good sign that your bit's getting dull is that if you're getting lots and lots of small particulate matter, you know, it's just kind of coming out as like a, a little bit of a shaving, your drill bit's actually not cutting, it's actually tearing at the tissue. So you'll wanna change your bit. And this is a good illustration of how that looks. So a nice sharp drill bit, you'll have these tissues and you should be able to pick up those pigtails and actually hold them whole. And it's a good indication also of if you're in healthy tissue, they should be nice and bright, white, solid um, and fleshy. If they're coming out punky, soft and dry, maybe you hit a decay pocket or your drill bit's um, too dull. So you should be able to have nice sharp uh, cuts onto those vessels. And think of this as, an, as a visual illustration. The xylem cells are basically just a plastic straw. And if you have a milkshake that you wanna drink out of, and granted our, our Arbitec solution is not a milkshake thickness, but just consider that if it's, a mil, if, it's, if it's a dull drill bit and you're trying to cut that plastic straw, what's it gonna do? It's just gonna grab onto that, that straw and it's gonna tear at it. It'll eventually open up a wound, 
but it's going to tear at it. And then if you're trying to, to drink that milkshake, it's not going to work. But if you have a razor sharp drill bit and try to drill through that straw, it's going to cut through it. You're still going to be able to use that straw because it's going to have a nice, sharp, even uh, cut to it. When we're drilling, we want to drill perpendicular to whatever that tissue surface is. Um, there isn't any reason why we want to try to cut at a downward angle to intercept those vessels. We want to drill 90, create a 90 degree angle with the tissue. So you can see me here, I have a nice 90 degree angle to that root flare. If we were in the middle here, we would want to have it at a 90 degree angle to whatever that tissue angle is on that root flare. And then we want to drill one inch past the bark into the xylem tissue. And that's another reason why we like to go onto the root flare or below the root flare surface is if we're above that into this really thick, craggy bark, it's really hard to know exactly how deep we went in uh, because there's maybe that thick, corky tissue. And when we're drilling, do it, have your drill on a slower speed setting so that you're not creating a bunch of heat. We want to avoid cauterizing that, that hole. Um, and that's where we don't want to spin the bit in the hole. You don't have to work it in and then out. It's just a one consistent motion in and one motion out. And you don't need to stop at the bottom of the infusion site and reverse the drill because it has that high helix bit it cuts on the way out as well. So it'll just clean that hole out. So you'll see it, it's just a clean, even motion in and out. I do want to touch on drills. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a drill, bit, a drill salesman. But I do want to make a point of have a good drill. And this is for any injection technology that you're using. Have a good quality drill with plenty of torque and power. Um, don't set up a technician um, with you know, a cheap drill that has barely any battery life in it. Um, is a frustration to work with. Make it you know, as light as possible for them to work because it's so much easier for them to manipulate how they're in, you know, where they're drilling and you want to have a nice, um, have it run all day. Um, some people prefer to use an, a, a plug-in drill because you know they're plugging in their macro infusion pump. That's totally fine. Um, you know, I don't recommend. I have seen people using um, like the still gas-powered drill. That's a bit overkill. They're just way too hard to work with. They're too big, and they can cause way too much cauterization. Um, I personally use a Dewalt uh, lithium-ion drill. Um, the drill, the battery technology these days has progressed light years from seven years ago or five years ago. So get a good quality drill, make sure it can um, last all day, have the drills charged, ready to go, um, and take care of drills just as you would take care of your chainsaws or any other piece of equipment. It'll definitely make your life so much easier. Um, now we'll touch on where to drill your holes. Um, so we want to make sure we're not drilling into or below dead or decaying tissue. You know, it's not going to, we're not going to be able to infuse into those tissues. We want to make sure that we're getting a nice, healthy vascular tissue. Don't drill into the deep valleys or sunken areas. And I'll kind of show you what I mean here. And then space your infusion sites or the holes about four to six inches apart. So for me, think about, you know, maybe like either the, the difference of your pointer to your pinky, or maybe your point your pinky to your thumb. And really the tree tissue is gonna dictate that more than anything else. If you've got nice, big, healthy root flares, you're gonna be able to go about four to six inches or four inches apart and get a lot of those nice infusion sites together. And really what you're trying to do is make sure you're spreading out because the vessels of the xylem, they just go north, south on the tree. They don't go left or right or east, west. So, so long as we're intersecting different vessels, we can get a better distribution of our fungicide mix. So here, I'll point out, this is on a, on a red oak, but I think it illustrates it nicely. You can see on those root flares where we've excavated, we want to make sure that we're hitting those nice, big, root, the, the kind of the lateral root flare. We don't want to go into these center cavities. And you're more likely to have a decay pocket there or some sort of weird structural kind of, you know, within the xylem, you're more often going to see leaking or a loss of your, your fungicide ready to use mixture. So just avoid those and just avoid them. So in here, we might go on the root flare here where this blue, blue uh, circle is, but then jump over to the other root flare there. And I'll point it out here on this elm. So I would avoid some of these deep cavities where I have the, the red cross outs. And here, 
in the center of the photo. I think there might be just maybe it was an old wound or something like that from a lawnmower or something like that. I'll want to avoid going to there. And certainly not every tree that we treat is in a nice yard with a nice sprawling root flare. So if you do run across a tree that has maybe a um, deck, try to go underneath the deck, or maybe there's a hardscape that you just can't move. We don't want to skip a whole half of the tree or section of the tree. That's where, unfortunately, we may have to move above the root flare. And we want to stay as low as we can, but we want to maybe go from this kind of cavity or wounded here. We might just go here. Um, and I try to get it in between the bark tissue or the bark crevices as much as I can. But we're just still, the goal is try to get even complete distribution of the fungicide with our infusion sites. This is a photo I took. Um, I, I saw this, unfortunately. This is not an acceptable um, layout of your infusion sites. There's a couple of issues here. Um, first of all, there's not nearly enough infusion sites and we're going above the root flare. So this person just didn't want to excavate the root flare um, for whatever reason, and they're not going to have great distribution. They're going to have excessive wounding. Um, yes, they are you know, somewhat on the root flares here, but there's just not enough infusion sites. They're going to have leaking. It's going to take much longer, actually. So that's a common misconception is that you know, excavating takes way too long. You will more than make that up in rapid uptake of your of your 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 solution than the time it takes to do that root collar excavation so always excavate the root flare always clean it off and make sure you've got good infusion sites so this is not uh, an ideal setup as we start inserting our t's after we've drilled them and i make um especially when we're doing these we don't want to drill too far ahead of ourselves of putting the t's in um, so if it's a multiple tree site you don't want to drill your infusion sites until you have a pump and harness ready to go for it um, because what happens if it starts raining or there's a lightning storm then you've already drilled the tree out and you have to come back the next day those infusion sites are already compartmentalizing as soon as you start to drill or once you you start drilling so we want to make sure we're only drilling out what we can treat and same thing if you're working alone or you have a partner um, these are quite small infusion sites. A 1564th drill bit makes a very small hole. It's exactly 1564th. It's hard to see, especially when you're working kind of below the soil line. So I don't drill more than maybe three or four, maybe six sites ahead of where I have T's. So you can see me here. I've got a couple of drilling of infusion sites that I'm inserting into. I'm only doing that. I put in three or four, drill the next three or four, then put them in. And this first time I'm putting in the T's, I don't actually need to tap on them with a hammer unless I think it maybe you know, it's not staying in on its own. And notice the arrangement I have here of these T's. I try to make them all go vertical north south. You can see in this photo back here, this person had them going left, east, or west. Those are much more likely to pop out. Um, we want to have them arranged north to south. You'll see this nice serpentine pattern I have going here. That is intentional. It's not just uh, because I think it looks pretty or it looks you know, professional. It actually has, it keeps the pressure in the harness even, consistent. So just make sure as you're doing this, make sure you create this nice serpentine pattern and I'll, and I'll kind of get to there in a second. So you can see here, this is on up close of kind of this serpentine pattern where I'm trying to go north to south on those vascular tissue. That's intentional. If we have kind of these you know, figure eights or it's an uneven pattern, you'll have pressure pockets in those loops. That's where you can have uneven distribution and uptake, or you'll have T's that'll pop out on their own. Now, you notice how deep I'm pushing these in. These are just uh, hand tightened in. It's because of the way the T is designed. We don't wanna push it in flush to that T. We wanna make sure that it's only going in just to the top of kind of where there's there's a hole there's two holes on one side of the T and then there's a, a square opening on the other. We want to make sure those uh, open sites are intersecting that vascular tissue only. And this is a, a nice illustration here. Um, we did this in our lab. So this is on an oak, but you can see kind of this is our current year xylem. If we were to try to push this T past where this opening is, we're actually injecting into heartwood. It's not gonna be an efficient uptake because it's not, it's not conductive after that point. And as Tom pointed out, 
Elms are only conductive for the current year xylem tissue. So pushing it in further just to keep it in there isn't going to keep it, isn't going to work all that efficiently. And this is an even closer close up to the uh, T's. And you can see kind of if we kind of go back from, so this is the, the openings right below here. I'm not pushing it in too deep. This is what is really it's being pushed into right about here on that. So not terribly deep. Now that we have our T, our, our harness all set up, we've got all of our infusion T's set in. And this is what we kind of call our tube and T arrangement is where all the orange T's and the tubing are. Now we want to set up the harness system. Now the harness is what pulls the product or, or receives the product from the barrel and the pump and puts it into this harness system. A common pitfall or error I see is people will have only one point of entry for that infusion. You'll, in the kits that come with it, there's always three black T's. Those black T's are splitters, and it's so that you have from the reservoir one tube that comes out, and then it'll split into two different directions. And we want to have that harness going in opposite directions so that it comes in on opposite sides of the tree. That gives us the ability to have this mixture cycling through the entire harness system. If we have it only coming in at one point of entry, what happens is the product comes in on one side, and then on the back end of that, you actually have the product pushing against itself. And that's where you'll have more T's that are popping out because it's not actually flowing consistently. It's just kind of forcing and you'll have a pressure pocket at the back end. So always have two points of entry. Once we have that harness hooked up, you turn the pump on. And it's important to note that here, we don't have any Arbitect in the system. It's just plain water. We want to make sure we check the system, check for leaks, bleed out any of the air that might be in the system. This is a good example of you can see uh, it's not a great arrangement of T's. And you can see in that photo, there's a couple of air bubbles. There's the open spaces at the top here. That's the system fighting itself. It's, it's trying to get that product to evenly distribute and it just can't. So when we wanna bleed that system, just before we put in any Arbitect, pull one T out, just uh, pull it out from the tree just slightly so that it bleeds out any of that water and air and then push it back in once it's full, uh, once those air bubbles have cycled through. That'll dramatically improve your uptake efficiency. Our pump should be set at about 15 PSI is the goal, but we don't want to be getting above 18. 15 PSI is about perfect. Next, we'll want to mix in our Arbitect. Um, so you'll, you'll use the rate card, um, depending if you're doing um, uh, what size tree you're doing, you'll mix in the Arbitect, um, use a measuring cup, and this is an important distinction. You are using a fluid ounces measuring cup. Um, Unfortunately, I've seen people where they'll use a measuring cup from maybe like a dry powder or a wettable granular that is in ounces. That is a weight ounces measuring cup and it's, not, it's calibrated for those weights. Make sure you're using a fluid ounces measuring cup or, or beaker. When you mix it in um, and you pour it in, it should have a light yellowish color, but it should be clear. So you can see in this mix here, we can still see through it. It shouldn't be dark brown or cloudy or hazy. It'll be nice and easy to see through it. If you are getting something that is um, uh, kind of looks like curdled milk or it's very cloudy, it's very prob probable that you have hard water or high pH water. So the water is critical in this system because that makes up the majority of what we're actually infusing. So have a clean water source. Um, I don't encourage people to use their PHC truck um, with the water source that they've had spray mixture in. You definitely don't want to have fertilizer back in the system uh, because nitrogen, like nitroform, that just clogs up the pores of the tree. Because remember, we are just using, we're just kind of hitching a ride on the, vi the vascular tissues of the tree. So if there's any any nitrogen or residue from other products that are going into those vessels, it's gonna slow them up. They'll just get clogged and then it's gonna take forever for you to uptake. So make sure your tanks are clean. If you can run your water through a deionizer that cleans the water, but it also makes the pH neutral and you're gonna have far better uptake. 
So if you see a little bit of um, this uh, high water, maybe you're pulling from a well, uh, from a client that has a well, um, you can use uh, muriatic acid um, at a rate of one ounce per six gallons of water. Now, generally speaking, you don't need to use nearly that much muriatic acid. Um, if someone has water that's that high of pH, um, that, that's incredibly uh, high pH water, and I, I'd be surprised if they were able to use that water for anything. Um, but typically, you can just pour in a few drops, mix it a little bit, um, and it'll go back into solution. Now, be careful because muriatic acid is some pretty heavy-duty stuff, so make sure you're storing it properly away from metal, um, and make sure when you're pouring it in that you're using your safety precautions and not breathing it in. So just be careful with it. So we went through kind of the pitfalls of the macro infusion to where we are kind of in the process. So we've got everything set up, excavated, and these are where all of these pitfalls are. It's making sure that you work through all these, that you check them all, that you're not uh, skipping any steps because that is where you're going to have slow uptake or poor distribution. So I would actually just uh, keep these written out and in the Arbitect uh, product guide, it goes through these pitfalls. It's just nice to have these on a clipboard and you can just check them off. Yep, I did that, I didn't do that, did this, did this, because those are really, really what all these little steps add up to making an application go from the time you put in that Arbitect to the time it's done about 40 minutes. Um, and uh, Typically, I, I definitely would allocate at least a, probably a two hours for on-site time for a technician per tree or for a single tree on a single site, just because, you know, from the time they, they pull up, excavate, put their tubes and teeth in to going through it. So that's, those are the main pitfalls. Now we're on to monitoring the infusion. Uh, now, I call it monitoring the infusion because it is an active process. Uh, we don't want to just walk away and go off to the truck and uh, you know watch videos on our cell phone. We want to make sure that we're monitoring the infusion, checking for leaks. Um, you can start cleaning up your site. You know, maybe you put your shovel away or the Arbitect and the mix then the in the measuring cups um, to clean up our site and just make it look more more professional. And a point of this, um, you can also kind of listen for the sound of the pump because uh, you want to keep the PSI at 15 to 20 PSI. The pump should run at a consistent uh, pitch. If the pitch changes quickly or dramatically, it means you probably have a leak somewhere in the system. Maybe a T popped off or it's, uh, it's leaking somewhere from a tube or something like that. So just be aware so you can listen for that. Um, and then you should be done in about 45 to 60 minutes. Once it's done, um, you can start removing the tees. You know, so you unplug the pump, turn it off, start removing the tees. And I try to keep the tees as clean as I can because they're, they're wet, so they're gonna pick up any you know, uh, mineral soil that they come in contact with. I try to keep them as clean as I can. Maybe you have a, a tarp that you put them on or you're immediately putting them back into the barrel uh, that you stored them in. And then you can replace the soil and the sod. Um, and if you, if you get good enough, you can actually just, with sod, you can just cut out big sections of it and then just set it right back in and water it back in so that it can look like you weren't even there. Um, make sure you just keep all your equipment as clean as you can. Um, and I'm available to set up field training or answer any questions. This is my email and cell phone. Um, and we'll go into a little bit here on the equipment uh, maintenance side and just a little bit uh, more on how the equipment works. And this is kind of putting back the sod, watering it in. Let's touch on the equipment itself. So the macro infusion pump is rather simple. Um, you can see here, this is the pump. There's a PSI gauge. The, the, this is what uh, regulates the pressure. And then there's the filter. The filter has a clear plastic, the newer pumps have a clear plastic outer uh, housing. And then there's just a standard mesh uh, filter inside of it, similar to what you'd have in most of your truck pumps, but it's a little bit of a finer um, uh, filter. Make sure that you're checking the filter at least once a day and clean it off. Don't clean it in the barrel that you're gonna be mixing into because then you're just putting all that stuff right back in the barrel. And the point of having the filter there is so that anything that happens to be in the barrel, maybe it's sediment or some leaf tissue that gets in there, that gets filtered out so that we have a nice clean mixture going into those vessels of the tree. 
And then if you see lots and lots of little water bubble or air bubbles, pardon me, inside of your return, because the, the yellow hose or this clear hose here, that's your return. So whatever doesn't get pulled into the harness and put into the tree while it's running will get recirculated back into our pump. If you're getting lots of um, like fine air bubbles in there, it means probably your filter is just a little bit loose. So it's sucking in a little bit of air into the system. Just give it a nice little hand tighten there and then just double check that you have there should be a black o-ring in that filter housing to keep it sealed just double check to make sure that that's there when you're checking the filter um, make sure it isn't damaged um, you know, unfortunately sometimes they get stepped on um, if people take them out and they fall on the ground um, is it ru too rusty you know maybe if you use if you use a lot of muriatic acid just you have a lot of hard water or high ph it will over time break down that uh, filter because it is metal. Um, maybe you just need to change the filter. Um, is there any sediment or grass? Um, just remove that, wash it out with the hose into the yard or something like that. And it, uh, just an easy one is, is the filter even there? Um, that's definitely something we want to make sure is inside the filter housing. For your tubes and T's, um, make sure you're checking them for excessive wear. Um, out in the sunlight all day, they do get kind of uh, worn down and as you're moving them to make new harnesses or you know, putting in trees, um, just check to make sure that they're not wearing out. Um, I do recommend replacing them. If you use your macro infusion kit often, I would probably recommend changing your, your tubes and T's at least probably every two years. Uh, but just double check them. Uh, make sure the T's aren't bent or gnarled or, or brittle. Um, and replace those as needed because you know, ensuring that they have nice open uh, spaces is, is important for the infusion to work. Um, I mentioned the black harness connectors. Those, um, unfortunately, oftentimes people step on them uh, and they can get broken. Um, so make sure that you have those uh, because you do want to have three of them in your system to split the, the tubing and tees as it comes out of your pump. That will be a lifesaver for uptake time. As we kind of walk or finish here, um, it's, a, it's a process that has a lot of little steps um, that, that really add up to saving a big amount of time and also making sure that you have a very predictable protocol for protecting Dutch elm, or elm trees from Dutch elm disease. Pardon me. Um, if you have questions, um, our tech support staff is fantastic and we're here to support you and help you out with anything you need out in the field. And if you're looking to talk to your arborologist or your territory manager, um, give them a call in the field. Text them photos of what you're working with or maybe what you're challenged with. Um, we'll happily get back to you um, ASAP. And especially for those circumstances where, man, I got a, you know, someone's fence and I can't really get to the root floor. Where should I put my tees? How should I navigate this? Reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you out with those kind of unique quirky situations that you're working with in the field or if you have a new technician that's starting and it's their first time doing Dutch elm disease, have us come out and work with them hands-on. Um, there's nothing better than getting out the field, getting dirty and, um, and really doing it hands-on. So with that, if anyone has any questions, um, I'll stick around here. Um, that's my email, that's my cell phone number. Feel free to, to, to contact me or uh, anyone on the staff. We're, we're truly here to support you and help uh, get you taken care of. So any questions here? I'll take a look in the chat here. Uh, what is an average cost to macro infuse a 35 inch elm with no other work uh, uh, performed? Um, it's gonna depend a little bit upon certainly what your labor costs are, but uh, a common kind of price range of what people look at trying to be in the ballpark with that uh, with uh, Arbitex is somewhere in probably the, the you know the 16 to 20 dollars per dbh inch somewhere in there um was kind of a, a good ballpark that i would probably looking to be in there
quick reminder, um, thank you all for attending. Um, we do have a survey you know, that we certainly do like to have your feedback on. Um, if there's any topics that you'd like for the future or things I can do better, you know, such as make sure I have my microphone close enough that you can actually hear me, um, I want to make sure that we do that. Um, we do truly respond to what your suggestions are. Um, these, these educational sessions are for you. If there's topics or pest problems that are something that you'd like to learn more about, we do want to make sure that we are providing content that's valuable and in the field or valuable for you out in the field and with your teams. So make sure you to provide us any suggestions um, or if there's things we can do better, we're happy to do so. I'll hang around here for a few more minutes. Don't forget if you, if you didn't put uh, into the chat or your Q&A, your ISA number, or if there's people additionally in the room with you, um, make sure you do that. Probably by the end of day or early tomorrow, you'll get a, an email uh, from us as well to thank you for attending, but also it'll have a link to the recording uh, so that you can watch it again if there's something you missed or maybe someone else in the office that you want to have see it. Um, it'll be there along with um, the link to the, the five minute application video um, on our YouTube page, or you can just go search Rainbow Scientific on YouTube and it'll, it'll come up in there along with all of our, our webinars that we've done this year and a few years from the old, uh, the antiquities of years past. Question, uh, do you gently, do you recommend gently scraping bark to make for a good tea setting? Um, what about hose clamps to mitigate risk from leaking from tea elbow connections? Um, good question. Um, for the first part of scraping the bark, um, if you're on the root flare down below, you really probably don't need to scrape the bark. Uh, a, a brush is sufficient to kind of give you a nice connection, especially if you're going, if you're arranging that T on the north to south kind of uh, uh, angle, you'll have pretty good connection. Um, I don't recommend using like a wire brush. I think that's too uh, aggressive, but a nice firm brush um, that you buy at Home Depot, like the one I had, I think it's a, I think it's for tiling is kind of where I found it, or it's in the kind of the gardening sections. Those are quite sufficient to give you a nice uh, uh, session, section to kind of work in. If you do have to go higher into some of that corky bark, I, I don't recommend scraping it, but it may make sense to um, just with your hand, just kind of break off a little, like a little area to kind of set your tea in. I'll, maybe I'll go back in my section here just to kind of show you what I mean. Um, that may be prudent. Um, I think I have it. Yeah, so if we had to, let's say, instead of being down here where it's smooth, maybe we're up here higher onto the root flare, you might break off this little section just to make sure that you get a nice uh, space to go in there. But you don't want to be, I wouldn't use like a, a, a any sort of a, a metal tool to create an opening for yourself. Um, as far as hose clamps go, I have seen that done. The downside to the hose clamps is that if you're if you need to make you know let's say it's a 30 inch tree to a 45 inch tree, how you get those sections to attach can be more of a pain. Um, if you're having a lot of tees like that are popping off from the tee at this elbow this joint here, it's a good bet that maybe just replace your tubing um, as it gets soft and you know from years and years of use, um, it can just get worn out and it just needs replacing. A question on which is better, 110 volt or battery powered pumps in your experience? Um, you ask 10 different people, you'll probably get 10 different opinions. My personal opinion is I really dislike carrying car batteries or marine cycle batteries because they're heavy as all get out. So I would do just about anything to, you know, whether it was carrying like a thousand feet of extension cord. I prefer the wall plugins uh, because if your battery runs dead, you forget to charge it the day before. I just preferred having the wall plug in personally. Um, so I would either run it off of someone's house and the homeowner. And to that end, with the homeowners, you know, if you can use their water or in their electricity, it's just a part of kind of prior to getting to the job site, just to make them aware of, hey, this is a part of the service, so on and so forth. I would do that. Some people have Honda generators, the really quiet ones, those work really well. And you can power, I think like eight pumps off of it because the pumps don't pull that much electricity. 
or um, nowadays with vehicles, like I've seen in some of the pickup trucks, they have um, actual plugins. Um, you can use those. So I'm a personally, I prefer the wall plug-in. Um, that's my personal preference. Um, there's a lot less stuff to carry. Um, yeah, so if you did miss the first couple minutes, um, enter your applicator license in for credit. Um, just put it in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll get that recorded. Do you have anything to, do you do anything to the tree, the tree flare after you remove tees and equipment, holes especially? Um, so I don't do anything specifically in there as far as, um, you know, I don't, I don't, once I drill a hole, I don't uh, clean them off anymore, like, you know, uh, flush them with water or put anything in them. You can't use the same uh, infusion sites in the next cycle. Um, and most often, that's also partially why we prefer to go, John, on the root flares. Three years from now, those infusion sites are going to be compartmentalized, and the tree is probably going to put on half an inch to an inch of, of new wood every year. So you won't even see those. Um, but if you do happen to find a space where maybe, you, let's for this photo again, let's say next year I see this infusion site here, I might just go laterally in between it above it. Um, just so I'm not intersecting that exact same tissue. Um, great question. Um, the mounting bracket uh, on the pump, that is a standard piece that comes with the, uh, the macro infusion pump. So I'll scroll to that photo. Um, the question was, does that come extra? Is it a spare part? I'm sure you can order it as a spare part. Um, there, I think maybe um, so there's a, a little uh, kind of uh, shepherd's crook that attaches here on the top of here. That comes standard with it. It does, it's not attached to it um, simply because it makes shipping it much more difficult to have that attached there. Um, so it's actually in the bottom of the box with it, but it does come standard with um, all new macro infusion pumps. Um, I should mention, um, uh, John, there was a thought that did occur. Um, let's say you do your macro infusion um, and you also want to do an insecticide treatment um, for, um, oh, I'll just say elm leaf beetle or uh, European elm scale if you're in Wisconsin or uh, 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 Denver. Um, you could use those same holes today um, if you want to do an inj injection for, with an insecticide. You could use those same holes the same day to do that. Yes, you could do that. I, I should have mentioned that as well. Um, cleaning and disinfecting afterwards. Um, for cleaning, I, pref I like to try to keep the tubing and tees as clean as possible. So in the, you know, either where if you've got a, a tarp and you can just rinse them off with a hose, that's ideal just to kind of get all that, that, so, that soil off. Um, some people do uh, uh, use a, a disinfectant, uh, like a bleach solution, just to kind of clean off anything on there. Um, that's not a bad practice, um, but I don't recommend um, taking those infusion teas, spraying them with like a Clorox or any sort of a, a cleaner, then inserting them into the trees. Um, I would, if you're going to insert, just make sure you're disinfecting them maybe at the end of the day. And as far as end of year maintenance goes, I take them in like a Rubbermaid tote, uh, like a 50, uh, it's not a 55, but like a 25 or a 35 gallon tote. And I'll put some warm water with some Dawn dish detergent. And I'll just give those tubes and tees just a once over with a brush and just let them air dry. Um, and I'll run the pump with some clean water just to kind of let it uh, sit. I do try to take the pump uh, filter in the housing off um, if I'm storing it for more than a day without usage, just so that, that that filter dries out and it doesn't get rusty and kind of grimy looking. Uh, perfect. Uh, what are safety tips with using Arbitec and other pesticides? Use what the label says, or do you need special equipment needs? Do you need to run lines until they run? Uh, they don't need to run with clear water. Um, safety is, or the, 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 the PPE is uh, eyeglasses, long sleeves, gloves, pants, closed toes, shoes. Um, pretty similar to any most uh, pesticides. 
Um, and that's also partially why when you're when you're inserting your 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 teas and running clean water, it has had pesticide through the system, so you'll want to be just aware of that. Um, there isn't any special equipment that you need, um, and you don't need to run the lines until they run with clear water. You don't need to flush the system if that's kind of what you're asking after you run. Um, like once all the fungicides mixture is done, you don't need to add water to flush it. Um, once it's all taken up, because it is quite diluted at that point anyhow, um, I just take the teas off and just run, just maybe soak them off the hose. Great questions, everyone. Checking through the questions in the chat here to make sure I didn't miss anything. I appreciate you all coming. It's been a pleasure. Um, it's quite warm out there for most of the country, so make sure that you're um, 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 drinking lots of water. Oh, there was a question. I apologize. I missed you earlier. What is the proper water to fungicide ratio for oak wilt? Um, in this case, uh, Arbitech would not be used for oak wilt. Um, you would want to use Alamo for oak wilt. Um, and the, the rate for oak wilt um, with Alamo is, depending on species, um, white oak is 10 mils an inch with one liter of water mixed per uh, diameter. I apologize, I'm, I should know this out of my head, but I think it's one, one liter of water per diameter inch with 10 mils of uh, Alamo. Uh, for red oak, it's 20, mils of al 20 milliliters of Alamo with one liter of water. I, I believe that's the mix rate just off the top of my head. Um, I need to confirm that though. Or I'd want to confirm that. Uh, sure. It looks like the questions have uh, tapered off pretty well here. Um, with that, have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, if there's any additional topics or questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we'll get your ISA credits uh, entered in here. And uh, thank you so much for attending. It's uh, absolutely our, our, our pleasure to serve you and uh, earn your business. So thank you and have a lovely, lovely day. Bye-bye.